I'm Jonah Comstock, Editor-in-Chief of Pharma Forum. I'm here at ASCO 2024 in Chicago, and I'm joined by two folks from Kite, a Gilead company, Dr. Ibrahim Al Husseini, Head of Medical Affairs, and Warner Biddle, Head of Commercial Affairs. Thank you both so much for joining me. Uh, thanks for inviting us. Thanks for having us. So first of all, uh, tell me about what Kite is, is presenting about at the show today. Maybe, uh, Ibrahim, you can start. Um, what are, you guys have two big ast abstracts, I know. Maybe give us kind of the, the rundown of those, and if there's maybe one more you think is, is interesting, too. Right. Sure, happy to do that. Uh, we're very excited to be sharing data from the long-term follow-up of our Zuma 3 study. It's a phase 1-2 uh, study that was the basis for registration in the adult ALL population. The important piece about it is that with the longer term follow up at four year mark, we're seeing 40% of those patients surviving. So it really speaks to the uh, efficacy, the durability of the response and the survival benefit that those patients get with one time treatment with uh, Tecartis, with Brixocell. So pretty important data for this patient population who are in the relapsed refractory setting who had, you know, uh, around eight uh, months of survival with alternative treatment options. So very encouraging data, very important ones. And then the Yescarda data. Yes, the other piece is a pilot study in uh, primary and secondary CNS lymphoma. Uh, rare indication, obviously, but a very, very high un unmet medical need. Those patients, when they relapse, they have very dismal outcomes and no potential, um, you know, good treatment options for them. So Yescarta was uh, used on, in a pilot setting in a collaborative study that we had with Dana-Farber, and we're seeing a very good response rate. So knowing that this patient population is very highly uh, underserved, this data forms a, an important foundation to look into options for treating those patients with CAR-T, specifically Yescarta. And Warner, put this in a little more context in terms of how it fits into Kite's larger strategy and, and why the, some of these announcements, these um, publications are significant for the industry? Um, well, I think they're significant because if you take in particular the Takardis data and the four-year data and you couple that with the long-term data that we're seeing with the Escarta and LBCL, second-line LBCL with a Zoom and 7 study that we talked about uh, last year, yeah. as well as the long-term data that we're now seeing in third-line LBCL with our Zoom and 1 study, you're seeing a more complete picture, I think, of how CAR-Ts can impact patients for a longer-term survival benefit. And I think uh, Kite and the data that we're showing with both Escarta and Takardis really put us on the forefront of this long-term data, which I think is really, really exciting for patients. It's exciting for our treaters as well. Um, tell me, tell me a little bit about, um, in terms of like cell therapy. I know there's autologists, there's allogeneic. There's a lot of conversation right now about sort of like where we're going. How do these two um, work? How do they fit into kind of that um, that paradigm? Uh, for us, uh, these these two uh, presentations are related to Yescarta and Tecarta, who are already approved uh, in the marketplace. We have five indications that are approved right now, but we're thinking about the future to really um, overcome the high bar that we've been able to achieve with the first generation in Kite's terminology with the Escarta and Tecartes. Looking into the next generation uh, CAR-Ts, we have uh, three shots on goals that are in phase one right now, a bisystronic approach, uh, Kite 363, uh, CD1920, uh, the, the fast manufacturing product, Kite 197, and a product that combines the benefits of both the dual uh, targeting as well as the fast manufacturing, which is the Kite 753. All of them are in phase one right now. We're expecting to see the data towards the end of this year and make a decision with regards to the next development plan for this. The idea here is that we uh, want to optimize uh, the T cell manufacturing through uh, collecting of naive cells with the fast manufacturing and with the dual targeting overcome some of the resistant mechanism. So in essence, achieving a better efficacy and a better safety profile. So um, I, I know that a lot of the conversation too around these car T's has to do with the reimbursement side, has to do with how, how do you pay for them? How do you actually um, set up infrastructures that let you deliver them to, to all kinds of patients, even if they don't live near big medical centers? Tell me a little bit about Kite's approach on, on tackling some of these problems and sort of creating a sustainable infrastructure for cell therapy. It's a really important question and one that we're wake up every day thinking about how we can tackle this and improve on what we've already started. 
Um, but yeah, you've mentioned one thing that's really important is the authorized treatment centers themselves. We know that the closer we can get these authorized treatment centers to where patients actually live, the more likely that they'll actually opt in for getting an assessment for CAR-T and more likely they will actually go through with therapy as well. So we've actually spent a lot of time um, building additional authorized treatment centers, starting with, I think, initially um, in, in big academic centers, but we're starting to see um, a saturation point there. And we know that patients are still largely being treated in the community. And so we're actually working on our strategies to build authorized treatment centers, again, closer to patients, but in a community oncology setting. And one of the um, more recent, um, I guess, milestones was our announced partnership with Tennessee Oncology, which is one of the largest community oncology um, networks in, 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 in the U.S., as you know, and actually getting our first authorized treatment center established with them is a, is a key milestone for us and one that we're hoping that we can start to replicate as we um, move around the rest of the U.S. In addition to this, I'll maybe just add that in addition to the authorized treatment centers themselves, one of the other key things we're doing is reducing the manufacturing time for our, 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 our constructs. And, and we've actually recently announced the reduction of um, manufacturing time from 16 days down to 14 days for Yescarta. And by reducing the manufacturing time, we can actually reduce reduce the time it takes for patients to get their therapies. And we also know from the uh, from the data that if we can shorten that time even further. It also increases the chances that patients will actually get their therapies and, 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 and get the benefit from the CAR-T. So I think all these things need to come together as we try to improve access for patients and, and, and allow them to get access to what I think is really transformative therapy. I, I may add also that uh, although the data is not going to be shared at ASCO, but it's going to be at the European Hematology Congress coming up soon, is the outpatient approach to those patients. We know that that helps with alleviating uh, hospital capacity constraints, hosp hospital resource utilization. So we have a couple of uh, presentations that are going to be very informative about the feasibility of administering Yascarta in the outpatient setting and uh, being managed in such a in, in such a way that they can be readmit admitted to the hospital if they show the signs of CRS or ICANS. Uh, and there is also a study that's uh, coming from um, Mayo, Rochester, that is looking at the feasibility of administering both Yascarta and Takartas in an outpatient setting with comparable results to what you get from the um, in, in, inpatient population. That's fascinating. Yeah, and maybe just adding on that, I think um, the outpatient setting data, which Ibrahim is referring to, actually makes it easier for patients to actually get their therapies because then they can be closer to home for part of their duration treatment. But on the other hand, too, if you think about it from the hospital's perspective, it actually improves their situation because it actually in increases their capacity to treat more patients, which is another issue that we're trying to tackle as we continue to expand our authorized treatment centers here in the U.S. But how do you manage the CRS risk when, when you're seeing patients at home? Are, are you using like sensors or something? Yeah, it's a great question. Overall, we've seen the safety algorithm and management of those patients evolve quite substantially over the past six years, uh, and it improved quite a bit. So when you look at the great uh, three CRS with the new uh, safety management, it really uh, went down to almost zero. Uh, for the grade three and above, and the ICANS is around the, the 20%. So those patients, when they are in the outpatient setting, they can utilize also remote monitoring with uh, wearable devices, uh, consultation over um, Zoom calls and, 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 and engagements with their uh, treating clinicians. So that's one of the ways that this can be managed. And of course, they have their caregivers also being very well educated on how to pick up on any uh, change in their vital signs and bring them back uh, as soon as possible. All right. Well, I think I might have to wrap it up. I'm a little worried about this thumping base here. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, overall, at, at this conference and, and thinking about the, the European Hematology Association conference, um, what are what do you guys see as sort of some of the major major trends, major conversations around this area that you're in, blood cancers and, and cell therapy? Yeah, I'm happy to start. I think uh, uh, I mentioned the next generation assets, which is uh, quite interesting to continue to look at and see how much of an incremental value we're adding to those patients, both on the efficacy and safety side with the dual targeting. So there will be some data to be looking at. Uh, the bi-specifics are also uh, evolving in terms of lines of therapy. So it, it will be helpful to see how this data looks like, as well as the other CAR-T uh, options that are available for patients with more maturity of the data. Uh, we obviously have the, the leading uh, mature data in terms of uh, durability, uh, overall survival benefit. So it would be helpful to see how that uh, continues to 
um, pan out in, you know, amongst all of the other potential therapies. There is also more work in the research, earlier research, like in the in vivo cars, for example, allogeneic cars. So we'll be looking to see how this data matures and, and evolves over time. I think just adding to that, one of the other things we're really excited about is the coming data that we're uh, going to be seeing later this year for Anita Cell, which is our partnership with um, our Celix for multiple myeloma. Um, the initial data that we saw in the phase one was really, really positive, and this data is actually uh, due to come out later this year. And we'll be announcing also over the course of these two Congresses the structure for our phase three study as well, which is actually really, really exciting for us to get moving. We really feel there's a, an unmet need, um, even though we'll be third to market in this space, there's a huge unmet need, both in terms of efficacy and safety, but as well as the manufacturing capabilities that we believe Kite and Gilead can bring to, uh, bring to this area. So really, really exciting things to come. Awesome. Yeah, if I may add on the multiple myeloma front with a need to sell, uh, we're very excited about that construct because we believe that we have a construct that is very well differentiated to Warner's point, although it's not coming first to market. We're seeing very, very good efficacy signals uh, in both, uh, you know, the high risk population as well as the general population. And on the safety side, we are not observing to date uh, any of the delayed neurotoxicity event, which is a concern for, for this class. On top of that, the manufacturing excellence that we are uh, having at Kite, I think is going to be very helpful to get those products, th this product to patients as quickly and timely as possible. And there is an important uh, mechanism behind that differentiation because this uh, DD BCMA has a compact domain uh, and uh, it's a small uh, con construct and uh, it has less tonic signaling. So that uh, leads, uh, leads us to believe that the implications that we're seeing both on the efficacy and safety side uh, has a, a, a foundation behind the mechanism of action of the construct. So one last question, um, this is my asking everybody for my full roundup question this year is, what advice would you have for a young professional going into the oncology field right now? I'm happy to start. Uh, I think, uh, first of all, uh, a career within the academic space is always uh, fascinating. Uh, get involved in research work. I think uh, it's a fascinating world in oncology. And we see the uh, transformation that's happening and accelerating over time with new uh, products coming to the marketplace and opportunities to really have a difference uh, for those patients. But also consider uh, the work on the industry side of things, because in research, development, medical affairs are very good areas to, um, you know, follow a passion of developing new drugs and evolving the science and having a real impact on patients. Uh, Warner, you might want to comment on the commercial. Yeah, well, I mean, this is a conversation that I'm actually, I, I was telling Ibrahim, having with my daughter, she's uh, in second year right now at SDSU, um, taking a biology and chemistry degree, and she's very interested in coming into the field. And so we're having this conversation right now about what we do in this industry and all the passion that we have, as well as the terrific science. And to your point, just the incredible progress that we've made, but how much potential there's still left in the oncology field. So I think there's a lot of motivation, and a lot of... Um, hunger and desire from a lot of these young scientists to come forward and, and make a career in, in oncology. And we, we, we do need we do need more support, as you know, and more help to treat to treat these patients and bring these transformative therapies through the clinical development program so that we can get them to the patients. So lots more to come. Awesome. Well, thank you both so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. And uh, good luck with your, your presentations and at these uh, upcoming events. Thanks for hosting us. Thank you so much.